glad to be here. Um, I started at Kennedy oh, way back when it was a building on 707 North Broadway. And um, when I drove up here, I was like, oh my gosh, where am I? Um, Kennedy was where my passion for the field of special ed really became, was born and nurtured. And I know that if I hadn't moved too far to commute, I'd probably still be working here. But I moved to Massachusetts in 1984, and I work for Case Collaborative, which is a special ed collaborative, as an autism program specialist. I get to work with parents and staff, um, community members, and most importantly, kids. Um, as you can tell, I'm in my mid-50s, and I have only worked two places in my life. So need for sameness exists in the greater population as well. Um, I have two disclaimers. One is that I'm really most comfortable one-on-one -on -one with kids in either a desk or on the floor. I do some DIR floor time um, or facilitating social skills groups. So public speaking, mm, that didn't happen until I was much older and I really wanted to share my, my passion and enthusiasm. So once I get into the slides, like I might look like I'm reading a little bit now. Once I get into the slides, I morph into like Hans Christian Andersen for special ed, and it's all about stories and all about stories about kids. The other disclaimer is I have lousy time management. I know that you guys have to be out um, by around 12.30 to 1. And so either I'll be finished in half an hour and we'll have to find something to talk about, or You'll be home eating dinner, and I'll still be standing up here talking. So if you know, I'll try to keep keep an eye on the clock. Um, I think that people create or embrace strategies that match their personal, their core values. And for me, I have a core value that kids do best when they have all the information they need to do well in a situation. When there's a meltdown, when there's a breakdown, when there's a tantrum, when there's a shutdown, the onus, the burden is on me to figure out what information I didn't communicate. It's on me to think, not on the kids to perform. And given that, I needed to find a method or a strategy to be able to communicate with kids in the most efficient, successful way. Okay, I'm also not technical, so I'm looking for the buttons. Um, I'm going to try to go fast through information that I think you probably all know about. If you don't, you can raise your hand. The other thing is, I'm happy to talk to people afterwards um, if you want to. And I'll give out my um, email address as well. Okay, so we know that kids with autistic spectrum disorder diagnoses are visual learners. We've just known about that. Um, we make so use single pictures, if-then pictures, schedules and routines. We, we kind of do things that take into consideration that this is the modality of choice. But why? Well, research shows that kids on the spectrum have a deficit in auditory processing and they have a relative strength in visual processing. So why not go in and use the modality that works best? And all this is in the notes. The other piece that's involved is that there's this cycle that goes on. So we know these kids have lots of information in there and they have good memory, but stress comes in and wipes it all out. And all that information that's in there that we're saying, come on, I know you know how to do this, or I know we've been this through this before, it's not, not reachable. They can't access it to be able to do well. And unfortunately, a lot of our kids spend a lot of time in stress. Occasionally I throw in these pictures because it makes me laugh. I don't know. But I found this on the, on the internet. I don't understand what you're saying. Please draw me a picture. So here's the first story. This is a story about a student, Bill, who was seven years old with an autism spectrum diagnosis. Mm, I don't like to talk about kids in terms of high or low functioning because I don't know how. 
I think the testing is kind of difficult to pinpoint exactly where somebody is functioning. But for this student, he was mildly verbal. He could access his, his words mostly when he was in a, in a bad situation. So every Wednesday, the collaborative has a half day. And this particular Wednesday, Bill was going to Minuteman. Minuteman was an after school program run by the local ARC. He went to the program on Wednesday. He came in Thursday and he started screaming, no Minuteman, no Minuteman, no John, and hitting himself. And we thought, oh my god, there's a staff member named John. And John's this horrible man. Oh, we better, we better take care of it. Called his mother. Oh, Wendy, you better call over at Minuteman. Well, we wound up finding out that John was a man in his 60s who was in a program at the ARC and he had Alzheimer's and he was in a wheelchair and he was a yeller and for my friend Bill who had lots of sensory issues that yelling felt like a hit. So I thought, wow, yeah, he's got to go back next week. How do I prepare him? We found out that they weren't going to be in the same room. Oh, well that's easy. So I made a visual for him. He said, okay, Bill, you're going to be in this room, and John's going to be in that room. It's going to be okay. He was still somewhat agitated, went off to Minuteman. The next day came in and started screaming, no Minuteman, no Minuteman, no John. He started thinking, what am I not, how, why can't I make him feel better? What am I missing? And I started thinking about the way his brain processes information and the way it compartmentalizes it. And I thought, oh, he's seeing a rectangle and a rectangle. That to him means same. And so I changed up my visual. I put him in a circle. I put John in a triangle. I said, you're going to be in different rooms different spaces, end of meltdown, end of tantrum. He didn't have the information. The information that he had suggested that he wasn't going to be away from the noise. When I presented it differently, it was OK. And that was when I realized how powerful the world of visuals was. I was a good old board maker girl, had my Mayor Johnson pictures all over the place. But you know what? You're limited. If you're out in the field and somebody's melting down, it's very difficult to get that computer out and start printing out templates. Sometimes you need to say things or do things that don't exist in a computer. So I started collecting these images and these visuals, and I had to think of a way to kind of organize them. And what I found was the when I was needing to create them was directly related to the cognitive challenges that my kids, my students faced. And so I started thinking about the visuals in terms of cognitive deficits. And the first one is the old deficit of theory of mind. I'm not going to go into it because you probably all know about, but like raise your hand if you know theory of mind and don't want to hear about it. Or raise your hand if you want to hear <laughs> a little bit. Okay, so basically, I'll do like a little tiny bit. Theory of mind is really the phrase that means, that's supposed to address the fact that Oftentimes, people on the spectrum, kids on the spectrum, have a difficult time understanding that other people have different thoughts, ideas, and feelings that they do. It makes it very hard to have empathy when you think that everybody is thinking the way that you're thinking. It makes our kids look extremely egocentric and narcissistic. In school, oftentimes, Theory of mind turns our kids into hall monitors. They're out patrolling the playground. They're out patrolling the halls. They see two kids talking and might misunderstand. Kids doing like little jabs. Oh, there's a fight coming. Got to get, got to get the principal. So they go into action. They're hyper vigilant because their perspective of what's going on is their perspective. Uh, these are also kids 
who oftentimes theory of mind kind of shows itself um, with difficulty expressing facts versus opinions. So these are the kids who might go up to someone who's older and tell them they're four score and 300 years old or go to someone with a weight issue and tell them that they believe the circumference of their waist is about equivalent to an orca whale. It's facts, but it's missing the piece of how that fact sounds to another person. So here's the story of the visual. This is a template that it's, I've used so many times. There were two kids playing one was Adam, one was Noah, and they were on the ground with blocks. And within seconds, the blocks were being thrown. And there was yelling, and kids were running. And it, we used to set them up with blocks in the middle of the floor, and we'd say, build something. So after the fighting began, I went over and I said, you know, Adam, what are you making? He said, a truck. He said, no, what are you making? He said, a building. So every time Adam put a wheel on the structure, Noah was, this is unconscionable. Buildings don't have it. Now, there was no communication going on between the partners. Every time another layer up was put on the structure, Adam was upset because trucks are only so high. And so we came up with a template that basically has two kids, or three kids, depending on who's there, and then a shared thinking bubble. Because conflict happens when you don't know what the other person's thinking. There's no plan. But resolution happens when you have a shared thinking bubble. We do this sometimes with kids drawing. We'll say, OK, here's a big piece of paper. Everybody go at it. And it's interesting to see how you know, everybody's kind of drawing their own thing. And you have a beach here, and a, a playground here, and a car here, and a helicopter. Oftentimes, it's restrictive interests all over in the mural. But nobody is kind of putting it all together. Like, oh, I have to know what you're doing or what you're thinking in order for this to make sense. So we came up with the template to help before play times to do a planning. What, how are we all going to put our ideas into this shared thinking bubble? OK. This is an occasion where, you know, sometimes you're in your protective setting and it's nice and easy. You get out your pencil. I have to tell you, I walk around everywhere with a dry erase board and a marker. This was a time when a student was going into the mainstream and they were doing, it's an activity called word walls where kids like jump or skip to different words and they spell it out. And I had a student, Tim who was in second grade and Tim was a pretty rigid thinker and Tim went into first grade for word walls. He walked in as always and they had made a circle and he saw a space in between and he put himself between Kate and Alex. Well the teacher called him over to get something from the desk and when he left the circle to go over to the desk to the teacher and turned around like gravity kind of moves kids like they might have been standing in a circle with a spot like some air but when there's nothing there one person goes a little to the right one person goes a little to the left and when he turned around he saw an intact circle without space for him the FBI was called, the CIA. There was persecution being, uh, being uh, accused. Um, it, it was a really tough situation because he felt personally threatened and he felt personally attacked. He ran across the hall to the self-contained classroom, buried himself under some pillows. And obviously, we know he wasn't available then for processing. But when he came out of the pillows, I recreated the, the circle. 
And I actually did it with one of those flip things where, you know, you go and then all of a sudden the circle came together, the space appeared. Uh, but I opened his mind up to the idea that that space still existed and that all he had to do was walk over to that place between Kate and Alex and he would find room for himself. He walked over and as sometimes as wonderful um, first grade kids can be, they just parted because they remembered he was there. And he walked in, he put his face in the picture, put his name underneath, case solved. Okay, next cognitive challenge is the challenge of difficulty anticipating and predicting. We see this all the time um, as the culprit in meltdowns. We know that anticipation is an emotion involving pleasure and sometimes anxiety. When you're like expecting something or you're not sure it's gonna happen, and then a prediction or a forecast is a statement that an event will occur in the future. Well, the future is really abstract for our kids. We know that for years, even regular ed classrooms have done really well by putting up daily schedules. We know that people, even like Regular people use visual schedules in their phones, in their iPods, in their computers. So this has become almost like a norm. This is a story, and this I, I love this story, like I kind of love them all, but I got a call one morning at 6 a.m. from a mom who said she was panicked because her son, who was on um, Risperdal and needed to have frequent blood work, to check his liver levels, was set to go to have blood work that morning. And the father, who normally holds him down, was out of town on business. Um, and it wasn't expected. And she didn't want to cancel the appointment, but she wanted help. And so I started thinking about, well, maybe difficulty anticipating and predicting is it it, it's sort of contributing to the anxiety, along with the stick. I mean, the, none of us love going for blood work. So I came up with a timeline for him. And the timeline included yellow with, with the feeling of nervous. And the strategy is looking at, he, he had a restrictive interest of cooking, love the food network. Um, and so he had Cooking Light magazine. And then, orange was discomfort and this was a, a boy with the old Asperger diagnosis and um, two cochlear implants so completely deaf with his implants out and so when he's uncomfortable he often takes his implants out um, and the strategy of keeping his thinking bubble filled with his favorite topics and then red was pain. And really, there's not a whole lot you can do with pain other than take deep breaths. He liked to hold his mom's hand. And he also liked to count out loud. And then blue, I know it looks purple, but blue was calm. No strategy needed. So we came, we sat down, and we put together this timeline. He said, okay, you know, you're in the waiting room. Waiting rooms can make people nervous. So that's going to be yellow. And then they're going to put that band on. And I, you know what? I would call that discomfort. And then the stick. Stick is red. That's the pain. And then the band comes off and the blood flows. And that's, that's uncomfortable. And then they put the Band-Aid off and they take the needle out. And that's more of like you're still feeling a little nervous, but your body's OK. And then you're leaving the building. He was going out to Friendly's for lunch. Home, computer, dinner, that's all blue. So when you look at that, how much of this experience is really going to be painful? Not a whole lot. You might be uncomfortable for a good part of the morning, but you're only going to be in pain for that little part. How much of the day is going to be spent in blue? much. When the phlebotomist came in and took him to the room, 
I literally sat in front of him because he took off his implants. So good thing we use visuals because uh, he couldn't hear anything else. And I literally stood in front of him and went, okay. And it went so fast. And when we hit this, I could feel him. And then he walked out, done without restraints, done without being knocked out, without sedatives. Um, and he was so proud of himself. He's six foot two, and he had come into this lab with a little stuffed animal. And he just, he walked out of there with so much confidence. And the best news was, a couple weeks later, I was talking to his mom, he had created his own timeline for the dentist. It's like, wow, that's, you know, that was great information. Because that's the piece that you always, okay, well, it worked today, you know, in our little bubble. But if these things can generalize, that's what it's all about. Any questions? Any? Okay. This little slide is just to point out, it's not what you say, but it's what they see. So we had an OT working with a student on um, healthy foods. And obviously she didn't think pretzels were. I kind of thought that was in the healthy food group. But she wanted him to start eating fruit. And she said, Shane, you only have to eat one strawberry. But she had a bowl of strawberries out. So in response to her, you only have to eat one, and then you get a pretzel, he threw the bowl on the floor. Because he was stressed, didn't really want to eat any strawberries. But in that moment of stress, he wasn't hearing the word, you only, the words, you only have to eat one. He was seeing a massive, massive carton of strawberries. So she rethought how she presented it. And when presenting one strawberry, and then he, he find, moved on to two, and then he would get the pretzels, behavior disappeared. OK. So oftentimes in schools, we give most of our information. We deliver most task directions verbally. And this was a case where a student was asked to write in his journal at the end of the day. And they asked, I don't understand, but they did have an after, an end of the day snack. And this student was screaming, did not want to write in his journal, was refusing. Um, the teaching assistant who was working with him was doing her best, saying over and over again, if you do your work, you'll get to have your snack. I know you want to do your work. But it was coming in almost like that Charlie Brown-esque voice, like wah, wah, wah. I think he had turned the channel off long before. And so we made a contingency map. These are wonderful. They were developed by a, an SLP named Pat Miranda. Contingency maps basically had the behavior you want that you're asking on the side. So it, she wanted him to write in the journal. And then you give the kids choices. OK, you can take path A. You can yell. Keep yelling. Go for it. But guess what? That paper's still going to be there. And you probably won't make it to snack. And then I always add like an emotion picture next to that. I know you like snacks, so I'm guessing you're going to be pretty disappointed. Or you can take path B. You, you could ask for help. Somebody will help you write. You'll get snack. And then the emotion is, I think you'll be feeling pretty good. You pick. It takes the power struggle out. No power struggle. It gives them all the information. Because if you can't anticipate or predict on your own, you're not taking in the information that's being presented verbally, then you're not thinking what happens here is actually connected to what happens at the end, where you either get snack or don't get snack. And it's a really nice way to kind of remove yourself and the struggle out and make it a choice. I will tell you that nine times out of 10, and that's not 
based on data collection. That's just kind of sounds good. Kids make the choice that lands them with the happier face. Okay, another anticipating and predicting issue can be more serious. And we have students who are very bright kids who have some pretty complex thoughts. And oftentimes, when they say something outrageous in a mainstream classroom, it's the quickest ticket out. Um, we were talking about this before, about how behavior is, you know, when you're in a, a regular ed building, behavior is sort of the, the string that if it breaks, the door opens. And we are in mainstream schools, we are in, in self-contained classes, but because there have been a few cases in Massachusetts where kids have committed crimes, um, because people didn't think they would actually do what they were thinking, um, public school principals have really tightened um, the ship and want to know that the kids obviously in their buildings are going to be safe. And we can't always predict that. But we also have to let the kids know who have these thoughts that thoughts are okay. And thoughts are okay to tell because I'll tell you, I'd rather know what some of the kids I work with are thinking because then I can do something about that. Then I can help them with that. I also think it's really important to validate to kids that thoughts are okay, that everybody has thoughts. We had them all day long. The problem is when thoughts cross over into actions and then consequences. And so my visual used a police tape because it's more alerting, like this could be a problem. I had a student that I work with just a couple weeks ago, his teacher said, you know, he's saying inappropriate things in the, in the mainstream classroom. What he did was he went to gym there was a substitute in gym, and for whatever reason, he made a decision in his mind about the substitute's sexual identity. And he raised his hand, I guess we, we worked on hand raising a lot, raised his hand, and he said, are you gay? And he was in a middle school, middle school kids were, oh my god, I can't believe he said that, I can't believe he said it to an adult. And the sub handled it, and I guess, well, I just said, we don't, we don't discuss that. But for him, that's not an answer. For him, he, he still didn't really get that what he said was, was not okay to say or to ask in public. And when he walked out of the gym, he made some other um, homophobic responses. So when I worked with him afterwards, I said, I want you to figure out where did you cross the line? Where did you go over that police tape? And he knew, he said, well, I was thinking about, she looked like she probably was gay and I really wanted to know. I said, but where did you cross the police tape? And he said, when I asked. And the fact that he asked, the principal considered not allowing him to go back, which was the consequence. So we started making sort of a sequence for him, because he gets these thoughts and they fire quickly and frequently that if he's in a situation where he's with a case teacher or a teaching assistant or a therapist, then he needs to check in before things come out of his mouth. And then we kept like a list of topics that, um, that are not okay to blurt, but they're thoughts that are okay to ask someone. But the someone is someone that we that we determine and include his 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 family members. Um, this is a really tough one, and it's probably the most crucial um, the most crucial behavior to tackle. But I can tell you that if we don't start allowing this, but making this separate from that will have really big problems. Does that make sense? Okay, all right.
So I love to get kids involved with their processing. We have some of the best tantrumers around. They are so good at it. And they, they kind of, they're the best at describing it. So we had a student, DJ, and DJ, was he was a bright 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 student who was a very inflexible thinker and it didn't take much to kind of send him into the land of destroy the classroom uh, and scream and then when it was over he always felt bad so I asked him what he felt like before one of those meltdowns and he said well I feel like my ears are starting to smoke and he actually did the drawings, and then I kind of just redid them for the slide. He said, and, and then what? And he said, I, I feel like I'm turning from a boy into a bomb. Mm. And then my eyes get red, and then the, the good in me starts breaking. How sad. He said, and then what happens when you're in that meltdown? He said, oh, my ears are gone. It's just smoke. And I've exploded, it says boom. My eyes are, are crossed and red, and I'm all bad. He said, and then what happens when you go over to the quiet space? Oh, well, you know, then my ears come back, I turn back into being a boy, my eyes are brown again, and my good box is back. Like, wow, that's so insightful. So what do we do with that? So we decided we would call the what he feels like when it's starting to come. We'll call that A. And we're going to call the meltdown B. And we're going to call the recovery and the quiet space C. So looking at that, DJ, what do you think we should do? And he said, when in A, skip B and go straight to C. Wow, I couldn't have thought of that. And he made himself a board game. And in the board game, there's A, and there are a certain amount of spaces, and you roll the die, and the goal is to skip B. You don't want to land in B, because if you land in B, you lose your turn, and you have to go back to A, because those are the consequences. The goal is to skip over B and go to C. And that was the visual that we kept up in the classroom. It was really powerful and really nice. And, you know, Milton Bradley might get a game out of it someday. Okay, so I think the last one in the area of, of anticipating and predicting goes back to what I said earlier. If somebody has a hard time, then I didn't give them all the information they needed, or somebody didn't. In this case, I would take the blame. We had a student that was going to Special Olympics, and he was 18 on the spectrum, and we had done all this practice with the OT and the PT. He could throw a ball farther than you, you can imagine. And we practiced the races and starting line and end line and the huggers, the whole, whole nine yards. We go to Special Olympics. He runs his race. He gets the medal. Ten minutes later, they call his name to go back to the line. He starts screaming and starts running. And the area where the Special Olympics takes place is not far from a major highway. And he's running. And I believe he, I was probably 20 years younger, but I was as not in shape as I am now. And I'm running after him. And finally, I catch up to him. I have a napkin. At Special Olympics, they give you hot dogs. So it had greasy napkin. And I always have something to write with. And I thought, I thought, like, what am I missing? What did I not give him? What I didn't give him was what would happen to the medal that he got when he went back to run the race again. And so I quickly drew the visual. Here you are, David. You're going to run again, and then you're going to have two medals. And he walked back to the finish, I mean, to the starting line. I forgot to tell him that there was like that part B. I was so worried about the physical part. 
I forgot that the, there was the part that in his mind, he did it. It was done. And then what would happen if I start all over again? Who will I be? Where will my, my medal go? What's going on? And so given the amount of information he needed, he was able to perform successfully. All right, probably our favorite cognitive challenge is the challenge of inflexibility. You guys can read if you want to read the story. But I work with kids a lot on black and white thinking and rainbow thinking and how black and white thinking closes doors and rainbow thinking opens doors. One of the ways that we reinforce that is when kids go home at the end of the day, and their parents ask them how their day was, or you as their provider ask them their day, it's usually based on like five seconds worth. That last five seconds, if it was good, <coughs> excuse me, then it was a great day. And if those last five seconds were not good, then his, their, the day was horrible. So we started assessing what the day was like after each period. Which one? I saw you smiling, I saw you raise your hand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that the calendar went pretty well for you. What do you think? Child circles it. We do it all day long. And then when we look at perspective, how the day was, it's based on the whole day. It's not based on five minutes. The other thing that we use, <coughs> excuse me, is called, call it the shades of gray. And I have kids that love doing this. So it's I love it, I like it, I don't care, I don't like it, and I hate it. And as you can imagine, the first time that we do this, um, we give kids different topics, it's either I love it or I hate it. <coughs> and then we talk about how these things change. So then we'll move them around during the year to show that you can be a flexible thinker. I had a student that only ate apples if they were cored and peeled. And he was in fifth grade. And cafeteria workers in public schools do not core and peel apples for 10-year-olds. And so one day he went home. And we had been working on this for probably a few months. And his mother was very excited and reported that she asked him what he had had for lunch. And he said that he had an apple. She said, who peeled it? Who cored it? And he said, no one. I decided not to be black and white about apples. So again, that's like the other story where you're so excited that it, it generalized. But it's a way for kids to see, well, I don't like broccoli. Oh, but I like broccoli with cheese. I don't like loud movies, but I like movies that are about puppies. So it helps in a small way them look at, a wor at the world in a more flexible way. And kids really love to do this. I have kids that want to do it all about zoo animals. Um, so in another venture to try to rainbow up the world, um, I had a student make a thought changing machine. And he got really into it. And he created a box with a slot in the top, and we made a bunch of thinking bubbles. And when someone in the class would have a black and white thought that was really getting them, because like, oh, I think we're all a little black and white, and I don't mind that. It's when it's not getting you where you want to go, then the ability to rethink it or think about it differently is what I think we have to teach. So black and white thoughts get put in the top. They filter around. He made like a cone. It was incredible. And goes around. And it comes out in the middle. When it comes out in the middle, you have to think about a way to rainbow up that thought. So for this particular student, CJ, who is on the spectrum but also has a schizophrenic di schizophrenia diagnosis, he said, I'm afraid of girls, so I should never enter a homeroom classroom. So that was his black and white thought. The way that he finally 
rainbowed it up was when I go to Mrs. Noakes class, that was the mainstream class, if I am put in a group with girls, I can ask my case teacher if I can move. And so he would put the black and white thought in the machine, it would swirl around, and it would come out as a rainbow thought. It's a way of teaching kids, it's a little cognitive behavioral, teaching kids that you can control and change your thoughts. <clears throat> I'm gonna try to hurry, I know. I look. You guys doing okay? All right, sure. Okay, so the next cognitive challenge, and there's only this one and one more, I promise you, is difficulty abstracting information. We know that these guys are pretty concrete thinkers. Well, I can tell you that once you put things on paper and you make them visual, you're already making them more concrete. Sometimes somebody will say to me, oh, now we're gonna get that picture, oh, that picture is so com The picture can never be as complex as the language that we often use when we're trying to exp explain something to a child. <clears throat> so concretizing social vocabulary. So there was a student that we worked with, and this was about a home situation. He had a sister who was unrelenting at bullying him at home, and his parents would tell him, Joe, go to your room. Joe, go to your room. And he interpreted that as a punishment for him, which, you know what, he's right. That's how it sounds. And so we made the visual that, Joe, when you're in the picture with Claudia, and the picture, the box encompassed Claudia as well, and she's making fun, who's there to hear it? He is. If you go to your room, or you go to the kitchen, or you go somewhere else, and you walk away, who's in there to hear it? Nobody. So we use the visual approach to kind of help him understand that go to your room, or go to the kitchen was not about him. It wasn't a punishment aimed at him. It was a way of giving Claudia nobody to bully. This story, which is really another, another favorite, is about concretizing the term disappointment. It's a very real emotion, and I, I've seen kids really fall apart after disappointing experiences, but don't know how to articulate what they're feeling. So it sometimes looks a little mad, sometimes looks a little sad. But this was a situation where a student, his restrictive interest happened to be government and uh, government buildings and presidents and he was going, now we live up you know, in Massachusetts, so going to Washington DC is like, oh my gosh, that's like the Disneyland of, of restrictive interests. <laughs> and so for him, he had been looking forward to it for a long time. His parents told him really early that he was going in two months. So for two months, the lid was coming up. Anyway, he came back from this weekend in Washington, and he became aggressive at home. And he was hitting mom a lot. And he was saying that he was doing it because he was tired. So he talked to mom, and she said, you know, he's sleeping. He slept on the trip. He's been sleeping since he came back. And so I sat down with him, and the more that I listened to what he said, the more I realized that he was just feeling that letdown feeling. You know, you're looking forward to something for so long, and then it's over, and then you want to hit someone, or you, you don't know what to do with yourself. So I said, you know what? You were way up here thinking about Washington, and when you came back, you had a drop. And that drop is called disappointment. It's feeling let down. And when you're let down and disappointed, you're feeling like you need to hit. But guess what? And I drew this out for him. When you hit mom, mom talks to dad, and this was all in 
stick figures and speaking and thinking bubbles and mom saying I don't think we can take Greg on these vacations anymore because it's too hard to handle him when he comes home he was astonished whoa wait that came out of my hitting mom no idea of what happens and the consequences and the chain of events so I said guess what when you feel let down or disappointed, the trick is not to go back up that high anymore. Start in the middle and think of something to look forward to. And so this was a kid who was a teenager but still really into the Easter Bunny. And so he said, Easter, chocolate. And that made him feel better. And I thought, okay, you know, we've gotten over, stopped hitting. He was now th preoccupied with thinking about the Easter Bunny. But the next fall, he came in, and the family always went hiking and camping in New Hampshire. And they went to a certain campground every summer. And evidently, that summer, this, the summer that had just happened, they weren't able to go because there had been a lot of rain in the spring and the campground was flooded and so they couldn't go. And I was like, waiting to hear, so what happened? He said, Orlando in November. He got it. He got not to bring himself so high, but he also got that the way you get over that really icky feeling of that trip that you were looking forward to ending was to replace it with something coming up. I thought that was like, I, I'm always so amazed by the kids. Like, honestly, they're the best teachers. Um, I'll skip that one too. Holding a grudge. I don't know if any of the kids you work with, especially, not even so much the older kids, but have trouble getting over things. You know, still thinking about something. I had a student who insists He's now, he's now actually, we, we educate kids in Massachusetts till 22. So he's not 22, but he's in that 20 to 22 range. And he still thinks that when he was six, I threw a rock at him. I, I would like never do that, but in his head, and he's held that grudge from six to 20. So this is a situation where he had been bullied by a student named Rob. And he was, he was so stuck that he couldn't have been more stuck <laughs> if there had been a lock on in his brain. And he couldn't do anything. Couldn't do work. Couldn't play. Couldn't eat. He just kept talking about how Rob had laughed at him on the playground. And so I took him for a walk. And we got to the cafeteria area. And there was this nice little bench there. And he sat down. And I said, I had a dry erase board, and I said, you're, you're in a box. You are stuck in this box. And I said, as long as you're stuck in the box, you can't think of playing on the computer. He loved music, listening to music, going outside. Um, and he, he said, come on, um, Shelly. And he wanted me to sit with him. And I said, can't sit there. I'm not in the box. You know, I know that you're upset with Rob, but it's over. And until you can cross out that angry picture in your thinking bubble, I'm afraid you're going to stay stuck. And the interesting thing was he was on a bench. There was no lock. There was nothing there, to no restraint, nothing. And yet he wasn't moving from this bench. I held the dry erase board and finally, and when I say finally, I'm talking not five minutes, it was probably closer to an hour. He took the marker and sort of in an Eeyore-esque way, okay, and he crossed off the angry picture in the thinking bubble and stood up like there had been this box that he was locked in. Stood up, went back to class, went on murmured a few times about Rob, but was able to still, to still complete his day. Well, a couple weeks later, 
he hit someone in line, a girl named Claire, who was pretty defenseless in our classroom. And I swear, I'm not like a, you know, eye for an eye kind of teacher, but something must have been in me that day. And anyway, he did what he had to do to repair before he could go outside went outside, came back in, and he was on medication that caused his appetite to skyrocket. And he asked me for a cracker, and I said, and I own it, um, I'll have to think about it. Ooh. And he said, Shelly Green, you are in a box. You are still mad because I pushed Claire. And if you don't get rid of that angry face, you cannot teach young children. But he was right. I was holding a grudge. He hit the most defenseless child in the class. I was angry, and I hadn't let it go. But the best part was that he got it. And you know what? It, they're not one-time learners. I'm not going to pretend that this was the cure. This is the cure for all grudge holders. It's not, but it's a way of explaining the need to take that picture out and to replace it with something because it keeps you from moving on. He's now, all these years later, still holding that stone grudge. But I can say, no, you're in a box, and I'll stop. So after a while, when you make these visuals, you don't have to keep making them. You develop the verbal cue that goes with it, and that's what you use. For students that deal with the abstract concept of worry, this particular student is an arborist. She loves trees, so we made a worry tree for her. And for every leaf, she articulated a worry she had. Some of them were, this was right before summer, she hates when the sun sets early, she hates late sunrise, she doesn't like dark, she doesn't like hair dryers, which I guess don't really have to do with the season, but oftentimes when you go swimming, you have to dry your hair afterwards. Too loud, too hot. She, Kimball Farm is like an ice cream and miniature golf place near us. She doesn't like going to Kimball's too much weight for food, for the ice cream. She doesn't like picnics because they're bugs and the weather's hot. There's a hot theme going on. She doesn't like the beach, hates the sand, too hot. She doesn't like going to New York to her grandparents' house because the food's bad and the house is too small. I did not touch that one. But we created a visual template of a worry trash bag or a worry trash bucket. And for that leaf, that worry leaf to go in, she had to come up with strategies. So in this case, out of 10 times that her mother asked her to go to the beach, she will go once. She'll wear water shoes because she doesn't like the sand. She'll bring a water fan because she doesn't like the heat. And she'll stay two hours. And given those strategies and those, you know, <laughs> the bartering, the negotiating, the leaf can go in the trash. I love to use kids' restrictive interests when I can because it's really motivating. For another child, we developed sort of a template for attacking a problem. This was a child who didn't like to do a lot of things outside of the self-contained classroom. It was really, she would say, I feel shy, um, very uncomfortable about it. And we started worrying that her world was getting smaller and smaller because we kind of worked with her mom on accommodating her worries. So her mom didn't take her to like Home Depot because she hates Home Depot. And mom didn't make her go shopping in big malls and because she doesn't like big places. But we started thinking that we haven't really taught her how to cope with them. So her world was going to be no big places. There was going to be no people in the, in the school other than the people in our classroom. So we came up with this template. There is a request. Claire, get one piece of red paper from the art room. The plus or minus was if she said the feeling, if it had a minus and she said, I'm feeling too shy, sometimes we would say, it's OK. Don't worry about it. If there was a plus, that meant that we were going to have to conquer that feeling. We were going to have to go through with it, even if 
it made us uncomfortable. She articulated she was shy. She was shy. And then asked her to come up with her coping strategies. She said, I will ask one short question, no long conversations. Meaning, I will say, I need one piece of red paper, nothing else. She said, no eye contact. I don't want to look at him. And then she said, I'll ask the art teacher I'm comfortable talking to, which I had never thought of. In a middle school, there's often multiple teachers. And I wasn't as sensitive to which teacher she would be most comfortable talking to. But she had that on her list of strategies. And then the outcome. And for her, she went to the, to the art room. She stood there. I mean, she was as exaggerated about no eye contact. She kind of turned her back and said, I need red paper, please. But she did it. And she felt good. She was successful. And she felt proud. OK, we're almost done. Another way that, just to give you some food for thought of using visuals for abstract concepts is some of the gradations in our world are really hard to understand. Like what makes something all versus less versus, and so we created visual templates for that as well. So all, all the boxes are colored in, gave some synonyms for all, and then most was one less, more, two less, some, three less. You can see all the way down to none. And the same thing for temporal concepts. So it just shows the flexibility of using visuals. All right, two more points that I feel Im important are the knowing the why. For some kids, it's not enough to just tell them or reinforce them or consequence them, and then they stop the behavior. For some kids, they need to understand the why of why you don't do or do do what you want them to do. And in this case, it was about interrupting. There is a student who is, you know, blurts out all the time. And it's really hard in a mainstream classroom. And the behavior, the ABA trainer who works with him had his token board and just was constantly pulling off tokens because he, he interrupts at a pretty uh, rapid rate. And so decided to make that interrupting more concrete. So I drew the visual of there were four kids in the circle. And I had one student talking. I said, when you yell out, you become big. So I drew him bigger. And I drew his speaking bubble taking over the other student's thinking bubble, speaking bubble. And I changed the student's face from being a happy face to being sad. And he looked at that and I said, yeah, you know, you take over when you interrupt. And look what happens to your friend's face. That was a more powerful intervention than just pulling off tokens. He kind of didn't get, I mean, in his egocentric little world, he was just given the answer. It wasn't affecting anybody else. But he has a good heart. And we forget that sometimes our kids will respond to emotions and will respond to given information about how other people react in order to change their behavior. It's kind of a, um, when you think about it, um, when we remove tokens as a way of teaching kids, we're responding to sort of that egocentric. You're not going to get that, that prize that you're working for, that computer time, that iPad time, whatever, if you interrupt. If there are no tokens left, nix say. So we're sort of reinforcing that the world is all about what you want. And if you don't get it, then you're going to have to stop interrupting. I love giving them a chance to modify their behavior based on doing something that will change the outcome for someone else, not just for themselves. And so 
these tokens to remove or not to remove? That is the question. This is a situation of kids in a social skills group, and at the end of group, they hold hands and they sing, like, friendship group is all done today, all done today. You probably have heard it before on the radio. Anyway, there's one child who does not like to hold hands. He screams every time. And another friend who really wants to hold hands, if I'm here and you're there and we hold hands at the end of friendship group, you have to hold my hand. And he was getting lots of negative feedback from his trainer, you know, in terms of, you know, let go of him, don't touch him. But then I thought, well, maybe he can't figure this whole thing out. So I drew the circle and I polled everybody. Um, Aiden, do you like to have someone hold your hand? Um, yeah, oh, okay. So I put a check next to him. Um, Adam, do you like when people hold your hand? Yeah, oh, great. Christopher, do you like when people hold your hand? No. Shelly, uh, I like it. And then I asked the trainer, Janine, do you like when people hold your hand? Yes. Then I could say, okay, Ian, who can you sit next to? You like to hold hands. Where can you put yourself in the circle? And he put himself between two people who had checks for liking to hold hands. So instead of behaving him away or tokening him away from trying to hold the hand of someone who didn't want it, it was really just giving him the information. There are people that like it and people that don't. If you like it, then like put yourself in a place where you'll be happy and they'll be happy. Last thing is that the last cognitive challenge is difficulty applying previously learned information. So this is what we all know when we've sort of done something for the last 180 days and 180 first day comes along and the same behavior happens and you think, oh my God, I can't believe we're still here. We create binders and every child that, um, that I work with has a binder that has five sections all about me, all about my classmates and teachers, visual supports, academics, and home. All about me, obviously. So they get to put in all of their strengths and weaknesses, likes and dislikes, how they think, um, their feelings. I have a lot of kids who are very cognitive and they're way smarter than I am. And they like to know which part of the brain does what. And so, and so literally, you know, there's that frontal lobe. Like, okay, so color code, which parts of your brain you think are, are working really well and which aren't. And they love to learn about themselves. Um, so that's in there. And then there's this section about classmates and teachers. And this is really important for kids as they get older in middle schools where for the first time they're switching classes. And so teacher A doesn't allow kids to use pencils, but teacher B in the next block, she only allows pencils. And teacher C gets mad if you stand up, but teacher D doesn't want you raising your hand to go to the bathroom, just wants you to leave. All that information that kids seem to keep in their heads is difficult for our kids. So that information lives in the binder. The other thing that lives in the binder are their visual support. So their social story, stories, their meters, their scales. Um, for kids, you know, years ago I had kids that were into Bob the Builder. And so when there is a social snag, uh, we had a blueprint of friendship. And it was a, like a work order. And the work order had what the event was, how people felt, and what the fix it was to fix the problem. And we kept them in a work order folder and transferred them into their binders. And then an academic section, how to inference, how to attack word problems, how to teach a game, information about the various forms of tag that exist, which is, believe me, in the hundreds. And lastly, I teach kids to draw too. So this visual is a visual of a, that a student drew. And he's over here. And the other side is a teaching assistant that worked in the classroom. And that teaching assistant um, had a hard time with his, um, his obsessive compulsive behaviors. And so he would do things like he went through a cycle where he had to wash his feet 
before he could leave the classroom. He washed one foot ten times and the other one and then he could leave and she would hide the soap. Or he would put tape on the backs of chairs. He had to label things. She would pull the tape off. And, and she, in her head, she wasn't being mean. She couldn't tolerate his needs. And his needs were born of extreme anxiety. But you can't just remove that. You have, to, you have to find out where that anxiety lives, and then you have to help diffuse it. But you can't just take the tape off or move the soap. Oh, so painful. And again, I'm not saying that we let him wash his feet and eventually take a full shower before he can leave the room. But we have to figure out how to do it at his pace. But she couldn't. And so he drew this picture, which was interesting. In the middle, that's a CD-ROM. He loved music. I, I had him for New Year's Eve. My husband and I got a call that his respite worker couldn't come. And we were like, oh, we have no social life. Took him a few years ago. My husband happened to have a CD in the radio that was um, David Sanborn, the saxophonist. And this student got in the car, and he said, do do all, do, does David Sanborn live in all Mercury Milan? So he was that, he loved music so much. And so he drew something that he loved that wasn't involved in a problem to sort of represent a power struggle. And I thought, wow, I could never explain to her how he felt as well as, as he could draw it. And then for another student, this was a situation where, you know, oftentimes our kids have to leave one program to go to another. Sometimes it's positive, they've aged out. And sometimes it's because the program can't accommodate the child's needs. And in this case, this child was in love with, loved the te teaching assistant in his old program. And her name was Kirsten, and Kirsten had blonde hair. And when he moved to the next program, the teaching assistant's name was Michelle. And there was nothing wrong with Michelle, but Michelle wasn't Kirsten. And he could never articulate in words how he was feeling, but he drew this picture of Michelle, who had dark hair, Kirsten turning into Michelle, and how sad that made him feel. And, you know, it's information that we get from kids that helps us know how to best help them. If we don't know that they're having these feelings, if we don't know they're having these thoughts, we can't really help them get comfortable in this crazy world they live in. So that's it. <laughs> the end. <laughs>